This podcast will be a review of cells that you learned in biology. This image right here just shows you a little bit of the different types of cells that are possible. This image actually only is showing blood cells. So there's all sorts of different types of blood cells and all cells come from what we call a stem cell, which is an undifferentiated cell. Undifferentiated is a fancy way to say not specialized. It doesn't have a particular job until it becomes a particular cell. When we talk about cells, we talk about the cell being the basic unit of life. The cell is the smallest thing that can survive on its own as its own living entity. There are organisms out there that are only made of a single cell, such as bacteria. So it's a simple unit capable of independent existence, and that's what makes something a cell. When we talk about the cell, we also talk about something called the cell theory. And the cell theory has a few statements that make it up. The first statement says the cell is the smallest structural and functional living unit, which is basically the definition of a cell. It's the smallest thing that can live independently. The second statement of the cell theory states that organismal functions depend on individual and collective cell functions, meaning an organism that is made of more than one cell depends not only on the cells functioning individually, but it also depends on the cells working together for the common goal of keeping that organism alive. Biochemical activities of cells are dictated by their subcellular structures, a fancy way to say cells have all sorts of activities going on inside of them and the structures that make up the cell determine what types of activities can be performed by that cell. Each cell is very specialized in what it needs to do. The biochemical activities inside of the cell, as determined by the cell parts, give it its specialized function. The continuity of life has a cellular basis. That's basically saying that all cells come from other cells. It's not like a cell can just appear out of nowhere. All cells come from other cells. So those are the four statements of the cell theory that are really important to keep in mind. When we talk about cells, it's important to remember that cells are very diverse. They're very specialized. So in humans, there's over 200 different, different types of cells, and each cell has a specific shape. Each cell has specific subcellular components, also known as organelles. Each cell has certain functions based on this shape and based on their subcellular components. So as you can see up here, these cells look drastically different. The top left hand side shows you some blood cells. The ones that are more purple are the white blood cells. The ones that are more pinkish are the red blood cells. Even from blood cells, they're very different. The two purple cells look different from each other. It's because they have different jobs. On the left hand side on the bottom, we have what's called pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells. Those are cells that have cilia on the outside, which are little hairs, if you remember from biology what cilia are they are pseudostratified, meaning they look like they're in layers. They are columnar, meaning they are column-shaped or rectangular-shaped. And they're epithelial tissue, which is a fancy word for the lining tissue. So pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. You can see that those cells look drastically different than the blood cells that you looked at before. On the bottom right-hand side, you can see what are called adipose cells, and adipose cells are fat cells. And you can see the nuclei of the fat cells are pushed way over to the side. And most of the cell contains adipose components, which are fat, basically. So adipose cells look drastically different from other cells. On the top right, we have bone cells. And bone cells are ring-like ring in structure, and you can see they all look very different than other cells on this page. This is just a kind of a quick look at the different cells that we have, and they're already very different from each other. Here's another uh, example of the different type of cells that we have. So the main groups of cells we have what are called epithelial cells, and those are connecting tissues and linings. So a lot of times we talk about epithelium in pathology. Anything that we talk about epithelial or epithelium, that means we're talking usually with lining cells. Um, you can also have skeletal mu or muscle cells. Muscle cells are cells that move organs and move body parts. Obviously, that's what the muscles are intended to do. Fat cells, which store nutrients, and that's what gives them their very full shape. Cells that fight diseases, which change in shape. Cells that gather information, like nerve cells and reproductive cells. So again, this shows you a very good image that shows you the wide variety of cells that we can have even within our own body. When we talk about living organisms, it's important to keep in mind that the cell itself is what is alive in the organism, 
and the cell itself can display the characteristics of life. So some characteristics of life include things like being able to reproduce. Individual cells can reproduce. If you remember in biology, you learned the process of mitosis, which is cell reproduction. Growth and development, all cells can grow, they can develop, and eventually they, they will die out. Respiration, so cells need to breathe. We perform cellular respiration in every single one of our cells. That's the way they respire. Metabolism, it's a fancy way to say that they need to eat and they need oxygen. Once they do the eating and the oxygen, that is gonna go through the process of metabolism to get broken down to get the energy out of the food. They're able to respond and adapt meaning they can change to respond or adapt to their surroundings. They also can get rid of waste. Cells are constantly getting rid of waste like salts, acids, extra water, carbon dioxide, all sorts of different waste. And all of these characteristics of life work towards one main goal, and that goal is to maintain homeostasis. If you remember back to biology, homeostasis is the normal internal condition of a cell. So every single one of these characteristics of life works towards the maintenance of those normal internal conditions. When we talk about cells, it's important to keep in mind that they are also just one level of organization that we can study. So if we start with the smallest level of organization, we can start with atoms. Everything is made of atoms. All matter is made of atoms. When you put a bunch of atoms together, you get some molecules. Molecules like, for example, monomers, such as an amino acid. When you put some molecules together, you get macromolecules. You put a bunch of simple sugars together, you're going to get a carbohydrate. You put a bunch of amino acids together, you're going to get a protein. So we put a bunch of molecules together, we get a macromolecule. Put some macromolecules together, you get those organelles. Remember those organelles, or if you remember back to biology, organelles are cell parts, and cell parts that each have their own particular function. You put the organelles together, you end up with cells. Cells are the smallest unit of life. They are capable of independent life. You put a bunch of similar cells together and you get a tissue. A tissue is a group of similar functioning cells. You put some different tissues together and you get organs. And organs are groups of tissues that work together to perform a function, such as, say for example, the stomach. The stomach is an organ that's made of various tissue, muscle tissue, connective tissues, and all of those tissues are working towards the process of digestion. So organs are groups of tissues that work together towards one function. Organ systems are formed when you put a bunch of organs together that work towards the same overall goal. So the stomach, if we use that example, is part of the digestive system. It works with other organs in order to perform the process of digestion. It doesn't just do the digestion on its own. It needs the help of all the other systems. So when we talk about different levels of organization, these are the different levels we're talking about. In pathology, you might find a problem at the level of a tissue, but then you're going to examine the cells in that tissue, and then you're going to look at what's happening with the organelles. So generally in pathology, we work from organelles up to organ systems, not as much in the atoms and molecules and macromolecules, but it's still important to understand the job of each of those things to see how they could possibly affect what could be going on in the body. So let's talk a little bit about the various organ systems of your body. There's all sorts of different organ systems. One of the organ systems is the skeletal muscular or musculoskeletal, depending on who you talk to. This system is basically the structure. It forms the structure and the support for your body. So your muscles, your skeleton, that's gonna give you your structure, it's gonna give you support, and it's gonna allow for movement. The respiratory system. The respiratory system is the one that allows you to breathe. It's the one that's going to allow for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide as needed. The excretory system, that's your body system that allows you to get rid of waste. That's the body system that allows you to get rid of urine and feces. Those are both things that are part of the excretory system. The skin system, the fancy word for the skin system is the integumentary system. So that's gonna provide an external barrier and it also is going to be a location for blood vessels, a location for receptors for pain, a location for receptors for temperature. So it's really important that you have those senses in order to keep your body protected. Digestive system, gets your food digested. The nervous system allows for those electrical signals to be sent throughout your body to keep your whole body going. The cardiovascular system, that's your heart, your veins, your arteries that keep your blood pumping to transport nutrients throughout your body. 
the endocrine system, that's the system that's going to get your hormones flowing throughout your body. That's the glands that you have. The reproductive system, that's the system where the sperm and the eggs are formed in order to allow for reproduction of the organisms. The lymphatic system and the immune system, we kind of lump those together. A lot of the components of the immune system are formed in the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a fluid system that travels throughout your body. If you've ever heard of your lymph nodes, those are part of your lymphatic system. When you get sick, your lymph nodes swell, and that's because they're producing a lot of blood cells to help with the immunity, to help fight off the infection that you have. So oftentimes the doctor will check underneath your neck to check your lymph nodes, and that is usually due to the fact that there's an overproduction of blood cells at the time to help fight off the infection that you have. So we talk about types of cells. There's two main types of cells. First are the prokaryotes. Pro means before, karyote means nucleus. These are the ones that do not have a true membrane-bound nucleus, and they also don't have very many organelles. These are only single-celled organisms, and the only prokaryotes that we know of are bacteria cells. They're very unorganized. They are very primitive in nature, so not very organized. You see it looks just like a big mess of stuff on the inside of the cell. That's a prokaryote. All the cells that we're going to look at in pathology because we're studying humans are eukaryotes. Eu means true, karyote for nucleus. So eukaryotes have that true nucleus, the membrane-enclosed nucleus, and other membrane-bound organelles. So they're going to be a lot more organized. It's a lot more efficient to be a eukaryotic cell because every organelle is divided by a membrane and every organelle has a very specific job. Eukaryotes can be single-celled. There are some parasites that are single-celled. There are some fungi that are single-celled, such as yeast, or they can be multicellular, such as humans. In eukaryotes, we've got plants, animals, protists, and fungi. So these are all the organisms that have a true nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, more organized and more efficient in their function. So when we talk about the eukaryotic cell, we talk about some general structures and functions that they have in common. So some things that all cells have, no matter what cell it is, um, the plasma membrane, which is your outer boundary. Remember, if you think about the plasma membrane, it's what we call a fluid mosaic. It moves around a little bit, and it's made of all sorts of different parts. You also have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is the intracellular fluid that contains the organelles. The organelles are all floating around in the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is surrounded by that plasma membrane, which is going to allow nutrients in and out as needed and waste in and out as needed. We also have the nucleus. That's the control center in the eukaryotic cell, and that's where it's containing the DNA, which is the boss of the cell. So let's talk a little bit about the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm basically takes up all the empty space between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Wherever there's not an organelle, there's going to be cytoplasm. There's actually three parts to the cytoplasm, so this is something you probably didn't really learn in biology. There's what we call cytosol, which is water with dissolved solutes. So all those nutrients that are moving across the plasma membrane into the cell is going to get dissolved first into the cytosol before it goes to its particular location or particular organelle. There's also cytoplasmic organelles, the metabolic machinery. So all those cell parts are going to be located within the, what, the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm holds on to all those organelles. And then there's what we call inclusions. Inclusions are basically droplets of stuff that can't be dissolved. So the cytosol is, makes up most of the cytoplasm, but occasionally you're going to get some droplets of things like fats, which aren't dissolvable in water, glycogen, not dissolvable in water. So if it's not dissolvable in water, it becomes part of an inclusion, which is included in the cytoplasm. So let's talk a little bit about the different cytoplasmic organelles. So there's membranous organelles like the mitochondria, peroxisomes, lysosomes, the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus. Then there's non-membranous, meaning they're not surrounded by the double membrane, the cytoskeleton, the centrioles, the ribosomes. So when we talk about these organelles, we're going to talk about each of them individually and what their job is. It's important to remember that some are surrounded by the double membrane and others are basically made of little fibers. Ribosomes are actually made of protein and RNA, so they're not surrounded by a membrane because it's a chunk of protein with some RNA, and that's what makes up a ribosome. So those non-membranous organelles are really important, and they all have their own job, but they're not surrounded by the double membrane. They're more fibrous organelles. So let's start with mitochondria. The mitochondria is a double membrane structure, and it has the cristae, the folds on the inside. 
It provides your ATP using cellular respiration. If you remember that process of cellular respiration where your body takes in glucose or the cells take in glucose, you add that with some oxygen from respiration and eventually you're gonna produce carbon dioxide, you're gonna produce ATP, which is your energy, and you're also going to produce some water. It's important to remember that mitochondria has its own DNA and RNA. So here's a picture of mitochondria and you can see that there's those folds on the inside, those shelf-like, what we call a cristae. That's where part of the process of cellular respiration is happening. So cellular respiration happens within these folds in the inside and the outside and across the membrane as the whole process occurs. Mitochondria look kind of like a kidney bean with little folds or shelves on the inside. Ribosomes. Ribosomes are granules. Remember, they're non-membranous. They basically are made of RNA and protein. In fact, they're made of a special RNA called rRNA, which stand, the R stands for ribosomal RNA. So ribosomal RNA and protein makes up a ribosome, not surrounded by that double membrane. It's where protein synthesis happens. It's where all the proteins are going to be made within the cell. There's two, actually two types of ribosomes. There's free ribosomes, which are just floating around, and they synthesize or they make soluble proteins, proteins that can be dissolved in water. Then there's membrane-bound organ ribosomes, which are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum to make the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and they synthesize proteins that are incorporated into membranes or they're exported from a cell. Endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. The ER is a bunch of interconnected tubes and membranes that have cisternae, which are basically swollen areas, as you can see on the picture. And the endoplasmic reticulum are continuous uh, with the nuclear membrane. They're basically offshoots of the nuclear membrane. The nuclear membrane extends out and turns into endoplasmic reticulum at a certain point. There's two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There's a rough ER. It's called rough ER because ribosomes are attached to the outside and it looks like studs or it looks like bumps. Then you also have the smooth ER, which doesn't have the ribosomes attached on the outside, so it just looks more smooth to the naked eye. So we've got, you see this image, you can see how the nuclear membrane kind of extends out a little bit further, becomes the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see the rough ER has a bunch of ribosomes on the outside, giving it a rough look, and then the smooth ER does not have those ribosomes on the outside, giving it the smooth look. So the rough ER has that surface that's studded with ribosomes, and it manufactures any protein that is going to need to be secreted, basically spit out of the cell, is going to be manufactured on the rough ER. And it also makes the membrane proteins and phospholipids. So it's going to take a bunch of stuff, put it together to make proteins that become part of the membrane. And it's going to put together phospholipids that also become part of the membrane, that nuclear membrane on the outside. So basically, if it needs to travel towards the outside of the cell or get out of the cell, it's going to be packaged and put together in the rough ER. The smooth ER has a couple of jobs. It's a bunch of tubules arranged in a looping network, just like the rough ER. It just doesn't have the ribosomes on the outside. So the job of the smooth ER um, is to work along with enzymes uh, to help break down glycogen, break down lipids and cholesterols, detox in kidneys and that kind of stuff. So if that's what they do in the liver. So you've always probably heard that the liver is one of your filtering organs. So one of the things that liver cells have to have is a lot of smooth ER to help this filter process happen. The smooth ER is also important for making steroid-based hormones to travel throughout your body. The smooth ER is important in intestinal cells in terms of the absorption of fats, the making of fats and the breakdown of fats, and the transport of fats throughout the body. In skeletal and cardiac muscle, the smooth ER is important to store and release calcium for muscle contraction. Calcium is an ion that allows muscles to contract and relax in certain concentrations, and the smooth ER is important to hold on to that when you don't need it or release it when you do need it. So the smooth ER is pretty important. The Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is a bunch of stacked or flattened sacks of membranes. The job of the Golgi apparatus is to modify, so fix basically, concentrate and package proteins and lipids. So these guys are gonna put everything into little packages for us. There are transport vessels from the ER that fuse with the Golgi apparatus, and then they pass through the Golgi apparatus to the other side to what we call the trans phase. Those are basically just the sides of the Golgi. I'll show you a picture in a minute. 
There are then vesicles that the Golgi packages the stuff into, and they leave the trans face of the Golgi stack and move to the different parts of the cell, whether that be outside of the cell, whether that be to a different location inside of the cell, those vesicles are gonna go wherever they need to go. So on this picture, you can see where the rough ER is located very close to the Golgi apparatus. The rough ER is gonna make the proteins, and then they're gonna go into vesicles that pinch off of the ER. That vesicle is then going to travel to the cis side of the Golgi, which is a fancy way to say the side closest to the ER, and then it's gonna travel throughout the Golgi. In the meantime, the Golgi is going to fix up those proteins as needed if they need a little bit of trimming, if they need a little bit of folding, the Golgi will do that. And as the protein travels through the Golgi, that fixing is done, then a vesicle is formed on the trans side, the side farthest away from the ER of the Golgi, to then that vesicle can travel wherever it needs to go throughout the cell or outside of the cell if necessary. Lysosomes. Lysosomes are membranous organelles, meaning they're surrounded by a membrane. They contain digestive enzymes, and those digestive enzymes have an important role. And they're going to digest uh, bacteria that gets ingested by the cell, viruses, toxins. They basically are the trash dumpsters for the entire cell. They also can break down non-functional organelles. So if something happens where a ribosome wears out, the lysosomes can come in and they can help break down that organelle so it can be put back together in a different way to start all over. They also break down and release glycogen. Glycogen is the storage molecule for carbohydrates that's formed in the liver, and lysosomes help break that down to release it for you know, energy. They also help break down bone to release calcium, which is important in muscle contraction and relax relaxation. They're gonna destroy cells that are injured or non-useful, so cells that get hurt. They're gonna actually start the process of breaking down that cell from the inside in the process called autolysis, and we'll talk more about autolysis. There's something within a cell called an endomembrane system. The overall function of the endomembrane system is to work together to produce and store and export biological molecules. So we're gonna watch a quick video of how these things work together. The nucleus keeps eukaryotic DNA molecules organized and separated from the metabolic machinery of the cytoplasm. The endomembrane system processes proteins specified by the DNA in the nucleus and assembles sterols. It sorts and ships both products to their final destinations. A nuclear envelope separates the nucleoplasm from the cytoplasm. Nuclear pores allow materials to pass between the two regions in controlled ways. Inside the nucleus, DNA instructions are used to make RNA. The RNA will serve as a message and as part of the cell's protein-building machinery. RNA exits the nucleus and enters the cytoplasm. Here it is used to make polypeptides. Polypeptides are fancy words for proteins. The surface of the rough ER is covered with ribosomes, on which polypeptides are synthesized. Flattened sacs of rough ER form one continuous channel between the nucleus and the smooth ER. Polypeptide chains that enter the channel are modified as they move through. Some are packaged into vesicles and released into the cytoplasm. Other polypeptides continue through the channel from the rough to the smooth ER. Many of these become enzymes that act in the smooth ER. Other polypeptides are released from the smooth ER in vesicles. Some vesicles move from the rough or smooth ER to the Golgi body. The vesicles fuse with one side of this organelle, releasing their contents into its interior. As polypeptides move through the Golgi body, they are modified and tagged for delivery to their final destination. The finished products are packaged into vesicles that bud from the opposite side. Some vesicles that bud from the Golgi body function inside the cell. For instance, lysosomes function in intracellular digestion. Others become exocytotic vesicles. They move the plasma membrane and fuse with it, releasing their contents into the extracellular fluid. Vesicles also form at the plasma membrane and bring material into the cell. These are endocytotic vesicles. Through the movement of vesicles, membrane proteins and lipids are recycled between the endomembrane system and the plasma membrane. 
Let's check what you've learned. Drag the text to label the components of the nucleus and the endomembrane system. The video shows you the different components of the endomembrane system, which is basically a fancy way to say the internal system of membranes that's all combined. It starts with the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope, and it connects to the ERs, both the smooth and rough ER, the vesicles that are used for transport, and the Golgi apparatus. All of those are considered part of the endomembrane system. The overall job of the endomembrane system is producing, scoring, and exporting molecules and using vesicles to do that. Their other job is to degrade or break down harmful substances like they talked about with the lysosomes. Um, the lysosomes are considered part of the endomembrane system, as are the vacuoles, which are storage units. So if you had to store something for later, you're going to put it into a vacuole. That is part of the endomembrane system. So the endomembrane system is all interconnected and they communicate with each other. This is showing you the picture of everything that's included in the endomembrane system, starting with the nuclear envelope and the nucleus, traveling all the way through the ERs to the Golgi to the transport vesicles. It does show you some different vesicles that are on there, as well as lysosomes in the plasma membrane, so different components of the endomembrane system. Let's talk a minute for a minute about peroxisomes. You probably didn't learn much about peroxisomes, if anything, in biology. Peroxisomes are membranous organelles, and they have powerful enzymes inside of them. Their job is to detoxify harmful or toxic substances. Cells generally produce toxic substances as byproducts in diff their different processes. Peroxide is actually produced by cells, so one of the jobs of a peroxisome and where it gets its name from is that the peroxisome is going to be the organelle that breaks down those harmful or toxic substances, such as the peroxide. They also neutralize what we call free radicals, which are just highly reactive chemicals that have unpaired electrons. If you remember back, the electrons that are unpaired are actually unstable, and they want to bond or kind of match up with other things. So peroxisomes are going to help neutralize these free radicals, give them extra electrons, give them something to bond to that's not going to be harmful. Cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton is a non-membranous organelle. The job of the cytoskeleton, it's an elaborate series of, of rods, an elaborate series of fibers that kind of travel throughout the cytosol. And they're made of what we call microtubules and microfilaments and intermediate filaments, which are kind of like in between microtubules and microfilament. The job of the cytoskeleton, just like your skeleton, is to provide structure to the cell so it does not collapse on itself. So it has a really important role. And it also allows for transport of nutrients and transport of vesicles, kind of creates a highway of sorts for the vesicles to travel along so they get to where they're going without getting lost. This website does a really good job going through each organelle and showing you its, its function. So cells alive, and you, if you go to this website, you can actually click on an animal cell. We are not as worried about plant cells, but animal cells are pretty important to us in pathology because that's what humans are, obviously. And you can click on this animal cell. You can click on any organelle that you would like to, and it'll actually tell you what its job is, and it gives a short description of it. So this is another really good resource for you to use. The link is provided on the Moodle page underneath the extra resources title.